there is something there. There is that the power in invoking and wrapping your orientation around purpose, particularly in the pitfalls and the valleys and the failures and the hard times. Ghost Cult Magazine welcomes in author and music industry professional Andrew Thorpe. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Keith. Those good to those be here. Yeah, Love man, the good. suicidal hat. Yeah, thank Love you. Tremendous. First of all, great to meet you and see you and talk to you here. Your book is awesome. Your new book. Uh, I know uh, to say like author and music industry professional is like a very short crib notes way of saying <laughs> you have many hats that you've worn and wear. And those are the two we're talking about mostly today, but I, we may encompass a lot of things. Your current new book is Failure Rules, The Five Rules of Failure for Entrepreneurs, Creatives, and Authentics, which I love that I love that supposition right there, that, that, that second part is the big part. Failure rules with an exclamation point in flames, it jumps out at you, right? And there's a lot of books like this out there. I think as a, I'm, I'm a, you know, in the, in the business world when I'm not doing ghost cult, and there's a lot of this sort of cult of help and self-help and professional advice. But I found this book to be very practically applicable, whether you are myself trying to run a small business, but also be in the business world, but also in the music industry. I was a band dude once, like we all were kind of. So I, I, a lot of things are, are, you know, jump out to me as sort of a signposts of help that I think we could all use. Well, that's a... Uh... That's great because you're you're one of the archetypes of people that I was hoping this book would resonate with. So to hear that from you is amazing because it really is. It's not like a business book, you know. Like in fact, the woman that did the cover art has done the cover art for a lot of Stephen King's novels um, because the company I worked with, um, Scribe Media and Lion Crest Publishing, you know, they're all book professional people. They all have resumes, resumes and pedigree and all that. And she's like, I am so happy to do this cover. It's not like the normal business book. And she was so fucking psyched to, to, to do the art design. She did a lot of the other collateral and everything else. And, and, and so I, I wrote this, not thinking of it as a business book. I mean, it was really my life story. And then I went from draft to draft to draft and shaped it. It became clear that, okay, well, this section has a lesson. This has a lesson. Oh, these lessons kind of group up and, and kind of uh, roll up into what might be a role. And so the structure just started revealing itself to me over time as I poured into it and kept doing rewrites and shaping it. And then it was like, okay, my story is kind of interesting. I think, I think it's useful. There's lessons to extract out of here. Great. That's, you know, reader facing. This isn't about me necessarily. Right. And then it was like, all right, let me layer in all my virtual mentors who have influenced me, inspired me, given me wisdom, you know, without even having met them over the years, whether it's books, podcasts, um, you know, music, of course, right? And I started layering that in and then it gave more structure, more width, and I think more depth to the book. And it became in the end, I think very little about me in the end, maybe, I don't know, you tell me after having, having read it. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of a through line, but it's also about these case studies, you know, uh, from a wide cross section of interests Everything from people in the cigar world to spy novelists to, um, you know, 10 pin bowler, Thomas Smallwood to uh, Churchill. And then, you know, my music heroes, Johnny Cash, Henry Rollins, Lemmy from Motorhead, you know, Jamie from Hatebreed, you know, Scott Vogel from Terror, all kinds of stuff. And like you mentioned, and we have, you know, there's a soundtrack attached to the book as well. Uh, and these are literally the songs that I was listening to while I wrote it. Some of them are not metal, hardcore, punk, and are outliers, but I was going to be authentic and say, you know, even these are, you know, even some mainstream type songs, lyrically, you know, they bolstered me during, during a lot of these times. So I included it because it was authentically apropos to, to the material. Right on. I actually listened to the soundtrack while I read the book. So that was, as soon oh, as nice. I saw soundtrack and book, I'm in, I'm all in, reeled me in. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to add Civ and Gorilla Biscuits in there also among the uh, heroes you mentioned, because my favorite hardcore band ever is Gorilla Biscuits. I'm from New York City originally. And, oh, nice. Uh, huge, hugely inf influential to me. And Start Today is like the Bible for me of, of New York punk. Although the, obviously you got, you know, John Joseph wrote the forward and it gets yep. no more New York than Cro-Mags and, and uh, John Bloodclot. But yeah, of course, you know, so many layers to unpack. Let's do this. It is part memoir. And I think... You did start out, it, it's very, there are very personal moments. And listen, sure. 
uh, anybody talking about the topic of failure and reflecting on your own mistakes and overcoming them is a, is starts in a vulnerable place, especially as a writer. This is your life a little bit peeled back at the beginning, especially. So you're talking about you know different ups and downs you've had and how you you know grounded yourself to overcome it. Clearly, you know these things are not intuitive. I don't know. We're, we're going to go back and say like if there is a uh, Andrew comic book origin issue number one if we open page one what's the beginning of the story so i think you know there was my my, my early adulthood 20s and the 30s it was go 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 um provide for the family i got married young uh, my ex-wife was 19 when she got we got engaged i was 24 didn't take long before my son came along he's now 21 uh, crazy to see him this old with dreadlocks and tattoos now and listening to rap music and being a very uh, <laughs> vigorous marijuana enthusiast. But, um, you know, so, you know, just in, in that, that stage of life, um, I was passion driven. You know, I was entrepreneurial, both by nature and by default, because I found that other ways of making money wasn't making me enough. And I had to fucking earn. Right. And so I became a, a very circum circumventing in terms of my ways to try to make money. And I was going after whatever I could. Um, and, uh, you know, music was at the forefront. So, um, when, uh, I got married, I got, um, the, the, as soon as I got back from the honeymoon, got a pink slip from being a, um, I was working at Ford credit doing collections, a collections rat. And I hated that job. Just the whole cubicle monkey kind of like sitting there automaton, just feeling anesthetized by the environment. And in me, I just like, I need to do something I love. I was not put on this fucking earth to do this. Yes, it's practical, utilitarian, you got to make money, all that. Understood all that. Um, and I got a pink slip when I got back from my uh, honeymoon. And it was like, all right, now I'm married. I'm laid off. Uh, what do I do? And um, I started delivering pizzas, was collecting unemployment. And I just had this dream for the record label. And in that empty space of the failure, I could hear like the clarity of my, inner, my internal spirit voice, which is a term I kind of coined in the book. Uh, that voice inside all of us that I think is there to hear in pivotal times of decision-making. And it became clear. And I was like, I am going to act on this latent uh, desire to start a record label. Didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And basically went and um, courted Breakdown, the band from New York City, old hardcore band Breakdown. I had knew, known that they wanted to do a record because I was shadowing a guy who ran a very small label in Philly. You might remember back in the day, uh, Chord Magazine met. And he had uh, too damn hype that label. The only guy I knew had a record label. So like days off, I drive out, you know, for free and just shadow him and run everything I could, you know. Um, and uh, he told me break down wanted to do a record. I drove to New York, met with him, hung out with him, ended up doing the deal. Still, again, not knowing what the fuck I was doing. Met was the one who did the distribution and all of that. Uh, ended up being a debacle in many ways, nothing against Matt, love the guy, he's tremendous, but uh, you know, there was some messiness there. And it was like, from the get go, I was like, all right, money's out the door. I still don't have a regular job. I'm going into this thing and now I got debt, I'm in it. There's nothing I can do. But there's also sales, there's also recurring revenue, right? And there's always a burn rate with, with, with the business and you gotta wait. But, but I didn't exactly know what I was doing. And then, you know, um, what I talk about in the book is I call it a Carl moment. So it's just this term that I coined basically about meeting pivotal game-changing connectors in your life, right? And I think many people throughout their careers are pointing back to a mentor or someone that, you know, changes their mind about something or enlighten them about a way of doing things or a way of being in, 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 in their business or in their entrepreneurial path uh, or something that just really changes the trajectory of where you're going. And I remember I got recalled back to that shitty job, the, the cubicle monkey job, and I was so fucking pissed. And uh, I was working out one night at, at the gym uh, after like 10 hours a day of collecting on defaulted auto loans and, you know, uh, behind uh, bulletproof uh, glass because the debtors often came in after the cars were repoed and I called to get them repoed and, you know, to raise hell, get pissed off. So uh, I'm in the gym working out and, um, you know, just like, praying, wishing, like, how can I focus more on the record label? How can I go more down that path and do something that aligns with that? And um, 
you know, there I see this guy with a Snapcase t-shirt on. And I'm like, ah, well, I don't really love Snapcase, but it's weird to see the guy with a, you know, a hardcore shirt in a, a Philly suburb meathead gym. So I went up and started chatting with him. Turns out he was the VP of Relapse Records. And, uh, you know, he had left his suit and tie job as an attorney because he wanted to do something that he loved. And even though it was less money, we thought alike, we sparked up a conversation about music, everything else. Um, I ended up applying for a job as, um, you know, to run the wholesale department there at Relapse and followed up, followed up a few weeks later, got me in for an interview and um, ended up getting the job. And it was like, I couldn't be happier. It was like, I now had like, you know, a paid internship essentially in the music business. And I just soaked it up. It was such a great place to be. I mean, <laughs> it was very uh, unconventional. It was in this warehouse in Upper Darby. I actually helped them uh, move from, from their Lancaster location to, uh, to Upper Darby uh, or Drexel Hillish or whatever it was around the time. And it was just a great environment. I mean, everybody there also ran their own labels, Gordon Conrad with escape artists. So just the camaraderie and the creativity there was amazing. You know, you had like Mastodon coming in and hanging out when the first EP came out before there were huge dudes from Dildor Escape playing coming in and hanging out. Like it was just a really cool place to be. Um, Matt Jacobson, who, who founded Relapse and now apparently is in a, like a, a kingpin of uh, uh, metal themed pizza shops on the West Coast. He was always great, you know, and fucking just really cool and, and, and funny. I mean, I remember like on the intercom every Friday uh, at six o'clock after they put a beer on your desk at five at six o'clock, he would get on the microphone and say, Relapse Records, this is your president. Does anyone have any marijuana? Please bring it to my office. It was like that kind of environment, like dogs running around the shit. But people were also working their ass off. They were serious. Like, you know, um, they were getting shit done. They were selling metal, you know? So it was like, that was that moment. Like, boom, all right, we got this twist. I couldn't have created it. I couldn't have manufactured it. It was almost a mystical kind of moment. But I believe that that's part of our journey. Like, I do believe that we have this voice inside of us and that there is this alchemy, spiritual or otherwise, where you can you know, see what your path ought to be and struggle to align with it. So I talk about that in the book a lot is, you know, your calling journey and how to find ways to align with it by listening to your internal spirit voice and manifesting that alignment in the world, um, sometimes even by force. But, but this time it was by, you know, almost providential. Nice. Thank you for that. I think it's really interesting. We, obviously today there's a lot of things, hustle culture and a lot of entrepreneurial information out there and you know sort of talking heads of the entrepreneur space you know i think there's a weird dichotomy that you know this weird disconnect between like obviously if you have your passion and you want to be self-made you have to have a certain amount of drive and and work ethic but at the same time as you pointed out in the book sometimes just pure work ethic can work against you if you're just blindly plugging away i totally relate to this as an as a, a you know quasi small entrepreneur small business owner and uh you know i often my i often question myself am i am i doing the right thing i'm pursuing this the right way can i can i possibly eat more minutes out of the day to work harder and sleep less you can't uh, not without sucking so i just find it very interesting and i wanted to ask your opinion about you know what like in a modern sense you cut your teeth you had this entrepreneurial spirit and obviously a lot of opportunities you made or or came you know came upon but i think in today's parlance, I think what people will get from the book is how do I not, how do I, how do I maximize my success with the least amount? You're going to have failures. You're going to, you're yes. flying by the seat of your pants. Sometimes yes. some of these dreams are big, 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 big blue sky dreams. So how do yes. you reconcile that? Well, that's a good question. And I think failure rule number four, which I call build your thing one and thing two dependency, which has nothing to do with fucking cat in a hat. It's more like I imagine Tony Soprano saying, hey, yo, we got our thing one and thing two. And, you know, that's kind of the vision I had in my head. Like I've been a vision, you know, Tony Soprano talking about it, right? And thing one is what I call your enabler, enabler pursuit, right? So it's building that scaffolding. It's building that uh, the belts and suspenders of your life. Like, yes, you need a dream. That's your thing too, your North Star, your aspirational dream. The thing that you think is probably the, your highest usefulness in the world, most aligns with your unique talent stat. St talent stack, excuse me, that's going to, um, you know, maximize your fulfillment, potentially your income, all of that, you know, your dream job, your dream business, whatever that is. But the reality is that doesn't um, get achieved in a vacuum. You don't reach that state in a vacuum. 
you need a whole bunch of other things to kind of support you, to build you up, uh, to build other skills that you can cross pollinate into your role in this thing to North Star dream that you might eventually move into. Uh, and so it's really um, building that, right? So the thing that can support you as you get there. So I go through a bunch of examples. So from the music related one, it's Bridge Nine Records with Chris Wren. Like Bridge Nine Records wasn't born because Chris Wren had a bunch of money to go blow on records that may or may not sell, right? Uh, it wasn't born like me who went into credit card debt to start Thorpe Records. And yeah, even though now it's looking back between Thorpe Records and Sailor's Grave Records, there were 120 records released and, you know, work with some amazing bands that like were some of my, you know, big influences on the punk side, U.S. Bombs or the Oi Band, The Business or, you know, Roger Moret from Agnostic Front, his solo album, you know, Roger Moret the Disasters and then on the hardcore side, Mad Ball, Blood for Blood, Sheer Terror, Slapshot, working with bands like that was amazing. But I didn't think through this kind of strategy in the beginning. I didn't. I had no backup, no foundation, right? I was leveraging myself wherever I could, running and gunning and running into failures, which ultimately, in hindsight, have really kind of crafted who I am, given me lots of wisdom over time. And I do not regret, but I also do not advocate that one you know, intentionally induce failures in our life, like set yourself up for success, right? So that's failure rule number, failure rule number four. And like, so Chris Redden's story, his enabler pursuit was Yankee suck. He went out, made all the Yankee suck merchandise, sold that shit, Fenway, wherever, made as much money as he can that underwrote and funded, you know, many of the early Bridge Nine releases. And I don't even know how long in the future. And it was also like this portfolio pursuits mentality. He understood like, He's not just running a record labor. He is an entrepreneur. You have to be very creative to find ways to make things happen and to support them and sustain them long term. And even now, I think he just opened, um, you know, a store partnered with, I think, Scully or something. I think it's called uh, some other clothing brand. He's got the store open. So it's like that mindset. And I hadn't yet developed that yet in the early years because I was young. I was in my you know, early 20s. Um, and in my later years, like, I fully developed that now. I always have two or three pursuits going on at one time. Some are active, some are passive income, a variety of different spaces. I've owned a gym, I've done online lending. I'm an executive FinTech banker now. So I help companies like PayPal and Venmo move money quicker in more interesting ways. I'm in the innovation lab. You know, I work spy novel. I wrote this book, like that portfolio pursuits mentality. And guess what? They're not, they all seem disparate. Like they're not connected, but they are. Like there's all kinds of skills that, that translate from one to another, you know? Like even right now, like, I'm going into, to, you know, as we record this, the book comes out on Tuesday. Failure Rules comes out September 27th. Go buy it on Amazon. Listen to the audio book. It's great. Um, but even now, like first week, like one of the things I have to do is rally family and friends to, to buy the discounted ebook and write a review and help trigger the algorithms, all that stuff. Right? It's part of the marketing plan that the team came up with. And it's like, you know what? I know how to do this because when I had a financial planning practice, that's how I started it. I had to do the uncomfortable thing of, you know, kind of harassing family and friends to help me get something off the ground. It's like these skill sets, they transfer from one thing to the other. Uh, and so you can have kind of a low meaning or practical pursuit that, that actually feeds into and builds you up uh, that uh, bolsters you in, you know, kind of your higher meaning or passionate pursuits or things that might more align with your, with your North Star. Nice. I will, as a long time, as a lifelong Yankees fan from the Bronx, who also lived in Boston for a long time, and I love Bridge Nine, I will forgive the Yankees suck shirts. I knew all about that, actually. And I also did sock shirts, and they did other things, and, you know, other other yeah. uh, teams would come to town, and they would rag on those guys. So it was always, it was universal, but of course, you know, I know. I think they also did the Pat shirts, like Giants suck and stuff like that. Uh, they did the, yeah. Pat, the famous, infamous Pat's shirts. That somehow made their way down to NY too. Uh, but at the same, I love that you brought up the portfolio of pursuits because here's a really good question I have, which is, okay, I have many very interests. Ghost Cult is just one of them beside my career. And I was taught, I just had a birthday. So I'm all wistful and, and uh, you know, reminiscing and also future thinking. So I'm like, oh, I would really love to write that book I always wanted to. How do I know when, if I have many things, how do I know one thing is failing and not succeeding to the level it should be. Is that a skill in itself to pick out like, oh, I need to put more attention into this. There's more potential here. Do you have a crystal ball? What do you use to kind of forecast for yourself for success? 
That's a, a really good question. I don't think there's really a solid answer on that. I mean, it goes back to like this very ethereal kind of idea I have of listening to your quote unquote internal spirit voice, which I think is a real thing, but it's hard to put your finger on it, right? You know, it's a matter of, I think, taking a lot of time in your life, especially the busier you get for intentional, deep um, reflection and, and, and solitude to really kind of hear that voice inside and analyze all the kind of currents of your life and how they may or may not intersect, where they may or may not be going. Right. And so it's an analysis of, you know, time capacity, uh, interest levels, you know, financial capacity, that type of forecast, forecasting, you know, really like understanding, and evaluating how you actually feel about certain things you're doing. Because I think we have a tendency to get into just like, you know, rote autopilot on certain things. And then we wake up one day, we're like, you know, I haven't actually liked what I'm doing for the past two years, you know. And I don't ever want to be in that space, right? When I'm in that space, I know I don't, I don't drift into that space. I'm constantly evaluating how I feel about everything I'm doing, right? So like I wrote a spy novel back in 2015. It did okay. I didn't put a ton into the marketing and promotion like I am for failure rules. There's, this is a lot more wider. I kind of built a whole universe around it, a merch company and all these other things, right? Um, but, you know, I, I kind of knew like, all right, I'm going to put that on hold right now. That desire is still there. I'll go back to that. I actually wrote another spy novel in the interim with, with a co-author that hasn't been published yet, but I haven't really thought about that space or that energy for a long time, but I can already see the arc that, you know, in a couple of years, that's going to come back in the mix and it's going to somehow fold into and be, I think, buoyed by what I'm doing here with failure rules, right? So I think a lot of it is just being in touch with yourself and how you feel about the different things and where they may or may not be going. Um, um, but you're right. I mean, if you're like driven, and you're a hustler, you know, and you're like, you know, a workhorse, which I am, I think sometimes we can trip over ourselves and before we know it, we end up in a place where we're like, oh, wait, what am I doing? And why am I doing this? And do I even really like that anymore? And how does that stack up against from a, from a time balance perspective um, with this other pursuit, which I actually really would want to do more? I mean, I think that's a very difficult thing. And obviously money is a part of all that because some things you have to disproportionately do more of whether you like them or not because of, because of, because of, uh, finances. It's a matter of how can I then find that isolated time for the other things where it's fully maximized, even if it's like just a small amount of time, but the effort I put in has the highest amount of impact, you know? Right. Oh, and one thing back to, back to the New York thing, I have to give you a little <laughs> anecdote on the, uh, you know, the Yankees suck kind of, you know, it's a little bit offshoot on that theme, but I remember when uh, <laughs> I had, um, I had signed Madball for an EP in like 2004 and um, that was kind of a big moment for the label. I am mostly kind of unknown bands on Philip Records prior to that. And that then led to a cascade of other kind of more well-known hardcore bands I signed. And I signed Slapshot too. And the EP that they did on Thorpe to tear it down had that song Fuck New York on it. And I can tell you that talking to Madball's manager after that happened, it was not really a great conversation. So kind of being in the middle of, of that, uh, <laughs> you know, that tension was was not fun. In the end, I think they're all friends now. You know, I know Slapshot did some shows with Sheer Terror in New York and all that. But that's amazing. And <laughs> and, and of course, yeah, those things never die. Of course, uh, you know, I think it's really interesting. I, you know, obviously, look, you know, I want I don't want people to come away from this book. I want them to go into the book. There's a lot to get out of it, and it's not very woo woo. I know you kind of downplayed it a little earlier here, but it's not a very woo woo stuff. A lot of this is, you know, you cite instances you pull out inspirations you quote very notable people but also people who succeeded you know it's one thing to have like a very deep and thoughtful phrase that's meaningful to you but actually to have it come from a successful person is much more impacting and i wanted to drive it back to this pma thing because i think mm -hmm. that's the uh, the journey of the entrepreneur the journey of the solopreneur is mm -hmm. uh, a pendulum of success and failure so i love to point out terror and hate breed, right? You cannot get, you can draw a straight line from early hardcore to like the constant, the PMA of today, the overcoming adversity, the, you know, not listening to the demons of the self and overcoming. Yes. I love that divinity of purpose sec yes. segment and shout out to Jamie, who is, you know, the king of this stuff. He needs to write a book actually. Um, I, I, I got a copy to him. We'll see if he, if he read, read it, see it or has me on this podcast too, but right on. I'm glad you mentioned, I'm glad that that resonated with you because the divinity of purpose, like that song, that phrase, that came to me in like the perfect time in my life. I, um, I had just separated from my ex-wife after 14 years of marriage, three kids. At the same time, I had a business divorce for this online lending company that I was running. 
where I, I stepped away because of a variety of reasons, you know, I, and then I, I, I had to reorganize my life. So no, all of a sudden I had no office to go to by day and no home to go to at night. So I'm living in a hotel room and that song, that song like kind of saved me, right? I'll, I'll even read the lyrics, you know? So from the chapter here, calling alignment with divinity of purpose, um, which is, has, you know, Jamie's quote from that song at the beginning, or not quote, his lyrics of the song in the beginning of the chapter. And it goes into it. And then, you know, the, the lyrics are, I felt the pain of discipline was less than that of regret, lifted one foot from the grave when the purpose showed its face. And when the skies crashed down upon me, I looked for someone by my side. You were there when no one else was. You showed me what's born doesn't always die, the divinity of purpose. And the divinity of purpose showed up for me, man. Uh, in that time, I ended up, you know, drafting plans and starting a consulting business that turned into a proper lead generation company that eclipsed uh, the income that I walked away from in this online lending firm. I also finished my first spy novel and began to mobilize that and, and come up with a self-publishing plan. I ended up doing uh, some plans for some more records on Sailor's Grave Records. I think Booze and Glory, Roy Band from, from England was one of them. And then also, um, I ended up really kind of shaping up my resume and uh, ended up getting my role that I now have in, in fintech uh, in kind of executive banking. And for me at the time, going from online lending, which is associated with payday lending and really viewed as kind of a subterranean underclass kind of like thing uh, to, you know, a formal corporate job in banking. I mean, it was like going uh, from being a porn star to a regular actor. So it was like a big deal, you know? Like, and all these things happened in that space where I could have just drowned myself in alcoholism and I'm, I'm no stranger to alcohol, I'm drinking bourbon right now. I could have drowned myself in sorrow or heartbreak or regret. I did none of that. And, you know, Jamie, the Tony Robbins of hardcore, you know, like his song, like that was my anchor. And so it's a key part of the book. Like it's the, the purpose, the divinity of purpose, whether you're a spiritual person, believe in God or whatever, whatever you think divinity is, there is something there. There is that the power in invoking and wrapping your orientation around purpose, particularly in the pitfalls and the valleys and the failures and the hard times. Right on. That was beautiful. I think it's really what it also rings true to me. And again, the lyrics of Scott Vogel and the lyrics of Jamie. And if you're a fan of heavy music, you can find there's no shortage of negative imagery that also inspires yeah. us because I think the human nature is we look to the negative and the evil and the bad to distract ourselves. But at the same time, I think it's the PMA and the positivity of, of good hardcore. It's not just about f finding a goal or a higher power or something to put your faith in, but it's also the faith in yourself. Because as I yes. said, the, the entrepreneur's journey is this real pendulum. It's a pit in the pendulum for real, yes, where yes. you cut yourself in half. Uh, do I, do I, you know, we all, live and die by some of these failures and it's so hard to overcome i'm no stranger to to it myself i've had mm. you know quite a few defeats i've tried to come back from so you know it's 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 a very uplifting book i don't know if that was specifically your goal yeah. but it is very it is a guide and it is very uplifting i have a really interesting question for you this is one i worked on really hard i appreciate you sure. uh if you had to prune the five rules to one what would be the that one rule you have to start with that's tough. I think it's bookended in my mind by the two strongest rules. Failure rule number one is failure purifies. Failure rule number five is you are not your failures. They're kind of equally important. I could get rid of the other three as long as those two stick around. I don't know which one I would keep the most. I think a lot of people struggle with the optics of being in a failure situation or experiencing failure events. So I think you are not your failures is very, very important to detach yourself from the optics of failures as you move forward. Um, maybe failure purifies might take the cake and maybe that's why that's number one, because I think it's, you know, we're so, I think, trained from the time we're young to avoid failures and don't do that because X might happen and you know, play the safe way and, and get the nine to five and, you know, take that linear path. And like the idea of, of failure is, 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 you know, warned against. And obviously we don't want failure, but if we know that actions and failure go hand in hand and the actions are going to have failure, even if the failures come, which they will, and we're trying to minimize them, then that is the more virtuous path. That, that's the path of highest meaning. You got to go down that fucking path. 
And it doesn't matter what the failures are that may come at you, right? And so to me, understanding that failure purifies, that as you go down that path and failure hits you, it's going to shape you. It's going to burn things off that need to be burned off. It's going to allow you to, to shed faulty foundations to build stronger ones with more wisdom and more intelligence, and more complexity. So I think failure rule number one, failure purifies is probably the best, you know, and it's, it's the image of the Phoenix, you know, it's rising from the ashes. It's Nassim Tlaib, the author of Nassim Tlaib, who actually shares my same publisher, Lion Crest Publishing. Nassim Tlaib talks about that anti-fragile. It's like, not only are you resilient, so it's, it's, it's better and bigger than resiliency, right? It's not just that you're resilient, you can bounce back up. It's that you actually gain from harm. Like the harm you're getting, the failure you're getting, you're actually gaining. Like you're coming back exponentially stronger as a result of it. You're not just getting up and keep going and get knocked down again and come back kind of in a neutral um, position. You're actually getting stronger. And so that idea of the hydra that just gains and multiplies by harm, it's just, to me, I think that's the most important thing to really take on and to, uh, to embody. There's definitely a quote in the book about being an octopus, right? Is that Gene Simmons? Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, right. I'm Gene Simmons. I invented everything and I take credit for everything. And I love Kiss. <laughs> Kiss is brilliant. the first band, but yeah, I'm, I, of course, I invented air and shoes. And, um, <laughs> you know, he. I love that quote from him. I know he just like is in the news for saying he has absolutely no friends. I think that's an outgrowth of what a shark he has been his whole career in business. Yeah. And Paul also, even though he's a little quieter than Gene, Paul is actually yeah. the, the real brains of Kiss now. But yeah. I love that quote from Gene and I'm gonna butcher it, so forgive me uh, in advance. Sure. But you know, it's like, if you're, if you're being octopus because if a predator takes one of your tentacles, you still have yeah. seven, That's you right. still have the yeah. seven. So I love that idea. And again, that has to do with, you know, diversifying and all these things. As we start to wind this down, because I wanna give you back your day, you're such a busy guy. Uh, I have to ask, I love this playlist and I love the idea that you did this video trailer that explains the book and the playlist. So let's talk a little bit about these these artists and these songs that really motivated you, help illustrate some of your points in some cases, yeah. beside the ones we already talked about, of course. Let's let's dive into this a little bit. Sure. So there, <clears throat> there's a lot of them I'm trying to think of. I mean, they're, they're all so meaningful and powerful to me and, and literally did inform um, how I saw many of the failure events in my life. But from an origin standpoint, the idea for this book came on a beach walk when I was, you know, uh, going through a personal divorce and just came through the, a business divorce. And I had a cascading failures for the last two decades where every time I started to get back on my feet, things got knocked down. And it was just like this, you know, up and down, up and down. And, but I felt stronger. I felt wiser. I felt like I had all kinds of inspirational kind of stories to, to point back to and inspiration points that were inputs that helped me get through things and I'm walking to the beach and I'm listening to music I had a playlist and it was cro Mag's Hard Times and Motorhead Ace of Spades and those two songs I was listening to them I'm like I'm writing a fucking book on the value of failure that was like 2013 started out with some loose notes the first draft was shit just like Hemingway said all first drafts are shit uh, it probably just sounded like me bitching and complaining about the things that went wrong in my life and as I dug in and it got crafted, it became what it is today, which, which, which I think is, I'm very proud of, you know, uh, I'm very proud of the book. It's authentically me. And, uh, you know, I think also is, I think, I think it can be valuable to the reader in terms of all the different case studies that, uh, that are in it. Um, but I think those two songs really, they're kind of the catalyst. And then strangely enough, your audience probably isn't into them. And I'm not like a huge, huge fan, but the one Eminem song, Beautiful Pain, I'm not really an Eminem or anything, but um, when I was going through one of these times, my cousin texted me the lyrics to that song and I downloaded it, listened to it. And that song, those lyrics were pretty powerful for me during this time. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole Phoenix image, that's why I chose to use the Phoenix in the, in the cover art and, and attach that to failure rule number one, failure purifies. And, you know, and then the, like we already talked about the Vanilla Purpose, that was a huge song that really influenced the book. Always the Hard Way by Terror, 100% uh, influence of the book. Um, Coughing Cats, who's a band on Sailor's Grave Records. Um, you know, the notion of burning the candle at both ends. One of their songs was uh, very influential. I mean, there's just a, there's a ton of other, oh, Sheer Terror, Love Songs for the Unloved. I got a Love Songs for the Unloved tattoo after my divorce and just kind of memorialize that and, you know I have a chapter that talks about that just recently sent a book to Paulie I'm like Paulie I'm sending you this book I write about the other literally like all right well I'm reading five other books now I can't tell you when I'll get to it but I will get to it I'm like all right all right so I just, I just 
we'll see. I'll probably hear from him in like 2028 when he finally read it, you know, uh, <laughs> after like some bourbon or right. who knows what else. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, there's so many more things to go, but I want to, I want to give you back your time. You've been very gracious and I really appreciate you humoring my questions and all this. Oh, uh, I think this, great, dude. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. I, I think this book has a lot to offer, not just for, you know, people who have shared experiences like we do, but I think that, I think this book is uh, really going to really help shape some people and turn their stories around. It is hard to overcome the pain of failure. It is hard to overcome the separation of loss. You've you've given a little bit of a roadmap of how you did it. Hopefully it can help some other people like their way. And I think that's the best thing about this book. So thank you. First of all, I appreciate that you actually read the book, clearly digest it, internalized it. That means a lot to me. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the interview. I hope your listeners do check out the book, Failure Rules. It's on Amazon. Everywhere books can be sold. There's also an audio book that uh, is, is really good as well. Narrated by Jay Asang, who did like the social distortion video for Machine Gun Blues. And he was a producer on Twin Peaks on Showtime, blah, blah, blah. And check out Soul on Fire Supply Company merch. You can find all that at andrewthorpeking.com and the YouTube channel too. I do a lot of cool videos Andrew, at Andrew Thorpe King. Check it out. I saw that. We're going to link everything in the description. We're going to drive people to get this book. And uh, once again, thank you so much for hanging out with Ghost Cult and our audience today. Thank you, man. Keith, have a great day.